Hi everyone, I'm Annabelle and for me, getting involved in the 40 days, one of the things that I've really been learning is how to be intentional, not just in setting aside time to pray, but how to be intentional during those prayer times. So before the 24 hour prayer, before my slot, I just spent a few minutes jotting down some things that I wanted to bring before God and some things that I wanted to pray about and hear his perspective on. And I found that that really enabled me to pray really intentionally and help stop my mind from wandering during my prayer time and within that one of the things that I picked up from the podcast from Liz is just asking God questions so when I felt God was speaking rather than just sitting with that I would then respond with questions like okay God what does that look like in my life or what do you mean by this and then leave space for him to speak and for me to just listen and I found that that has really increased the the depth and the fruitfulness of my prayer times and I would recommend it. Well, I am here with some members of a variety of ages of Church Central East, which is very exciting. Uh, Jenny, to start with you, do you want to give people a bit of a sense of what happened on Sunday, this last Sunday, a week ago, uh, and maybe a bit of the backstory before then, um, and then, yeah, a bit of a report of how it went on Sunday? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think a year ago when lockdown happened, we were all like, oh, no, it's all gone wrong, you know, East site plans, which we'd started making kind of January last year, uh, kind of completely fell through, basically. We had no plans anymore, as everyone did. Um, but actually, it's been amazing to see how God over this, over the year, has been kind of bringing things together um, without us having to do anything almost. You know, we, we've been gathering on Zoom as a kind of East site slash the international group um, since the pandemic started. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, but actually God's brought people along to us and we've um, been joined by quite a few different people from different places and we were able to start meeting kind of in September uh, a few times and then we met for the baptisms in February so yeah it's just been amazing to see what God has done over this year which we didn't plan you know it's like trust we trusted him and it's happened so that's been really exciting um, and yeah this Sunday we had our first kind of official insight um meeting I guess you could say uh, I think it went really well there were about 30 of us um, including children maybe a little bit more um, and we had definitely a real mixture of people from different places different languages um, and it was really fun to gather together worship God limited in a kind of limited way but worship God together and just yeah get sort of time together worshiping God and listening to his word um, and then afterwards, we were able to go to the park and have a socially distanced picnic um, in groups of six. Um, and that was really great for building that community as well. And I'm here with someone else who was able to join on Sunday. Do you want to give us a sense from your perspective how Sunday was for you? When uh, we uh, attend in the uh, meeting face to face, my f- feeling is very better. And I'm understanding very better than uh, Zoom. But uh, God bless for the uh, Zoom. We can see each other in the Zoom. But uh, uh, church is a uh, different things. And this uh, uh, the uh, last Sunday uh, we go to uh, we can uh, pray each other and uh, uh, brother team uh, lead us about uh, uh, one story about the Bible. After that, we go to the park for the uh, small uh, picnic. And uh, my kids uh, enjoyed it. And we are very happy about this time. And we want uh, uh, we can uh, repeat again these things. Change feeling all my family. We are happy after that. We said, my kids said, uh, Dad, when we can go again, uh, we want to go to picnic and play in the park. We love it. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, as uh, Church Central East goes forth, uh, Jenny, what could we be praying for you? I guess perhaps a longer term uh, thing to pray for and maybe something a little bit more close to now this term. How can we pray for East? Yeah, in terms of prayer requests, I guess in the short term that we would really grow close together. Now we're able to meet more in person um, as a family and the, the kind of logistics of just the meet and starting to meet together and the kids work and the sort of sorting all those things out would go um smoothly and I guess 
our prayer is really that God would come and meet with us powerfully by his spirit um, as we gather together um, and empower us to go out as well, um, particularly for the community around this area where there is a very few people who know Jesus. Um, and we really want to be for the area, for the east of Birmingham and to be reaching out into this area. Um, so, yeah, and that's another prayer, I guess, that God would just be at work in the hearts of people um, in the east of the city, um, particularly those from different places, different backgrounds, um, and that he'd bring us into contact with people who he's already at work in, um, the, the people of peace whose hearts are already sort of stirring and wanting to know him, and that we would have boldness as a church, as each, each all of us as individuals, to be sharing the gospel with those around us. Um, and obviously that he would gather many people from many nations like he's promised. Well, to finish this, I've asked uh, my brother here to pray for Church Central East and lead us in prayer. So uh, wherever you're watching this, would you engage with God and call out to him uh, as we are led in prayer? Go for it. خدا خداوند آقای پدر آسمانی شکرت میکنم خداوند به خاطر اینکه در کلیسای سنت شارلوس هستم روز هستم خداوند ممنون از اینکه خداوند تو منو هدایت کردی تو خانواده من رو هدایت کردی که در اینجا باشم اینجا خونه من و خانواده روحانی من هست. خداوند و ممنونیم که فرصتی فراهم شده تا ما در حضور تو باشیم تا از تو بگیم از تو بشنویم و در نام یگانه پسرت آنچه از غم درد و رنج هست رو خداوند به حضور تو بیاریم به دستان مهربان تو بسپاریم و خداوند ایمان داریم که تو اونها رو برمیداری و به جای آن شادی خوشی سلامتی خداوند و همه حس های خوب رو خداوند به ما میدی ممنونیم از این که نجات دهنده ما یعنی ایسای مسیح آمد خداوند ما رو نجات داد از گناهان و امروز در حضور تو در زیر تخت پادشاهی تو هستیم خداوندا محافظت تو بر ما خداوندا و به طور خاص خداوندا یک بار دیگه شکر می کنم از اینکه در این کلیسای مقدس هستم به نام پدر پسر روح القدس آمین آمین yes jesus آمین. hear our prayers for your church in the east of birmingham we pray you bless church central east so that many people from many nations would glorify your name in that part of this city in Jesus' name, amen. Fantastic. It's been really great over the last few weeks to see the baptisms that are happening at East. And it's been wonderful to hear the interview and to see all of the exciting things that are happening. Uh, we are going to move on now and we are going to have some worship followed by a talk. Jonathan is going to be talking to us more about the 40 days of prayer. Um, but before that, we are going to have uh, Johnny lead us in a liturgy and Laura in some song worship. In a minute, we're going to worship Jesus uh, with singing and Laura's going to lead us. And the first song is going to be uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And you might know this song. It, it's a very vivid song. It, it's a song that wants to transport us almost to the foot of the cross to be able to look at the cross, uh, to survey it. Uh, and it's not just that we want to look at uh, the cross, but the one on the cross, and to really think about what he did for us there. And so to prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for that, I've put together a liturgy uh, from a bit from 1 Peter 2, and I'm going to read out a line, and then I'd encourage you to read out a line, whether you're on, uh, on your own at home or with others in your house as well, so that we can declare this out together, but also prepare ourselves to meet that Jesus who died for us, but also rose again. So here we go. As we survey, we see one who never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not fight back when insulted, nor threaten revenge as he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. As we survey, we see the one who carried our sins himself in his own body on that cross, so that we could die to sin and live for what is good. By his wounds we are healed. 
as we survey. We remember that once we were like sheep. Foolish sheep who wandered off. But now we have turned to our shepherd. To the guardian of our souls. just spend a bit of time now just reflecting on the cross and all that the cross means um, and specifically maybe our freedom because of the cross that we can find in Jesus.
Father, thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for sending your only Son, who lived a life without sin, to die for a sinful world. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that even in your pain and even in your suffering, your love for us was greater. Thank you, Lord, that we now receive freedom through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we begin to walk in line with our freedom knowing that our past and our sins don't define us anymore. We have been set free. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh Lord, we rejoice greatly that we belong to you, King of Kings. How wonderful to be adopted by the Father, to be redeemed through the Son, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We celebrate you this morning as we draw near to you once again, joyfully grateful 
for all you've done for us. Receive our sacrifice of praise and our response of worship. Amen. Well, if you've been around over the last few weeks, you'll know that we are looking at a number of biblical examples of what God can accomplish over a 40-day period. It's like there's this recurring theme in the Bible of God setting aside 40 days with his people at key moments of transition where he works on them and instructs them for the next phase. If you remember, we started by looking at the 40 days that Jesus spent with his disciples between his resurrection and his ascension and how during that time the disciples moved from a place of fear to peace, from doubt to faith, from shame to restoration. Then we looked at the story of Moses and his 40-day encounter with God on Mount Sinai and saw how encountering God is both how we transition and also what we are transitioning towards. Last week, we took a small step back and explored what God is saying to us prophetically during this time. Ginny, if you recall, exhorted us not to go back to how things were before, but to be in faith and press into what God has for us next. And in this whole time of waiting, we're to consecrate ourselves, we're to get ready, we're to prepare ourselves in anticipation of what's to come. Now, building on all of this, what we're going to do today is return to the people of Israel in the wilderness At the point where we join the story in Numbers chapter 13, that the people of God have moved on from Mount Sinai to the desert of Paran, and they've come to the brink of the land which God has promised to give them. Moses sends spies into the land for 40 days of reconnaissance, and as we're going to see, when they return, there is both good news and bad news, which prompts the question, Will they respond with fear or with faith? Now, as we read this whole account of what happened, I want you to try and keep in mind what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 about this story. He says, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So there's something here that we desperately need to pay attention to. This is an example for us. This is a warning we really do need to heed. The question facing God's people then is very much the question facing us today. As we anticipate what lies ahead, all the opportunities that God has for us in the coming months, how are we going to respond? Will it be with fear or with faith? Let's dive into the story, picking up in Numbers 13, verse 1. Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. Then continuing at verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which he sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people, they're stronger than we. 
and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt, or in this desert! Why is the Lord bringing us to this land, only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them. I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, O Lord, are with these people, and that you, O Lord, have been seen face to face that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. <coughs> if you put these people to death all at one time, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land. He promised them on oath, so he slaughtered them in the desert. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them, as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Now, did you spot the contrast running all through that story between fear and faith? Somehow, Joshua and Caleb, they find a way to look into the future with courage and with faith, despite the very real threats that were lying ahead of them. And we'll return a little later on to see what we can learn from their example. But the overwhelming emotion running through this story is fear, isn't it? And, let's be honest, for some pretty good reasons. Verse 28, the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. Verse 32, the land will devour anyone who goes to live there. Verse 33, all the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Chapter 14, verse 3. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. These are legitimate fears. 
faced with those reports, it's understandable that the people were pretty shaken. And for us today, as we perhaps consider moving forward into an uncertain future, I suggest it's understandable that we would be ever so slightly shaky too. I mean, the last 12 months, they've exposed any number of fears, haven't they? Whether it's to do with our physical or our mental health, our education, our employment, our finances, not to mention the fear of being confronted with the reality of death. It's like we have lost the capacity to control our destiny that we thought we had. Reality is, never actually were in control, it was all a massive delusion, but this sudden awareness of our lack of being controlled is pretty frightening, isn't it? And as we now consider the next few months and all the changes we're going to have to navigate, how we're going to adapt and change our routines all over again, how we're going to overcome the social awkwardness of being with other people after all this time, all the new plans we're suddenly going to have to make with the nagging fear in the back of our minds that we might well be left with another huge wave of disappointment if things change and they all come to nothing. As we grapple with all of that, on the back of the year we've just had, it's understandable that we'd want to play it safe, avoid risk, just return to how things were before. Just like the Israelites who pined for the days of slavery in Egypt when confronted with giants in a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And so... Although God has been teaching us some really important lessons through this time, and although there is immense opportunity ahead of us, there are some wonderful promises from God for us to lay hold of right now, there's still a strong pull in many of us to simply go back to how things were. Because, let's face it, it's known. It's safe. It's where we feel most secure. But there's a haunting line in Numbers 14 that stops us in our tracks. It's a verse that absolutely nails us. The people, if you remember, are adamant. They want to turn around and retrace their steps back through the wilderness. And to be fair, the fear driving all of this, as we've seen, seems pretty legitimate. Until Joshua and Caleb hit them between the eyes with this line. Verse 9. Do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land. Do you see what they're saying? They're saying to rebel against God and to be afraid of the people is one and the same thing. To be scared of the giants in the land when God says go into the land is to rebel against God. In other words, fear and rebellion are not two different things. No, they are one and the same. And just in case you're thinking that's just Joshua and Caleb being a bit over the top, here's God's take on it. Verse 23. They will never even see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. What Joshua and Caleb call rebellion against God, God himself calls treating him with contempt. Which begs two questions. First of all, why on earth is this such a big deal? What is it about fear that causes us to effectively rebel against God and treat him with contempt? And then secondly, If this really is the case, how do we replace fear with courageous faith? Well, let's look at each of those questions in turn. Number one, why is fear so serious? Well, first and foremost, I suggest it's because fear treats God as too small. You know, I think a lot of the time, our fears tend to surround things that we turn to for security. Or to put it another way, fear often surrounds our idols, the things we look to instead of God. Ultimately then, 
fear is a kind of mistrust of God. It's like we cling to all these other things because deep down we believe that if we clung completely to God, well, he would just end up letting us down. If we clung completely to God, if he was our only security, then at the end of the day, he wouldn't come through for us. And so as a result, we look to other things, our own ability to fix things ourselves, our performance, our looks, having enough money to be secure, having that relationship, having the clothes or the house, the possessions to prove to others that we have really made it. We cling to all those other things for dear life, thinking that without them, we're doomed. And when anything dares to threaten them, well, we're fearful. And the reason we're afraid is because we have given more weight to those other things than to God. And in so doing, we're treating him with contempt. You see, when we're afraid of being without those other things, what we're really saying is God is smaller than this, that this thing is bigger, that this is more than God could ever handle, which is crazy when you think about it. As verse 21 puts it, the whole earth is filled with the Lord's glory. It's like if we would just open our eyes and see a glimpse of God's glory, if we saw how he fills the whole earth, then we surely wouldn't be afraid to the degree we are. In other words, our greatest need is to get a bigger view of God. If you like, fear is an absence of of thinking about God. Or should I say fear is an absence of thinking accurately about God. Fear is an absence of seeing his glory and having faith in him and him alone. So that's the first reason why fear is so serious. It treats God as too small. Secondly, it forgets his power to deliver and save. Straight after reminding us that the whole earth is filled with the Lord's glory. God then goes on to say in verse 22, they've all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I perform both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. He's saying, if you realised what a miracle it is that you got out of Egypt, why on earth would you ever be scared of going into Canaan? It's a similar logic, I think, to the one that Paul uses in Romans 8, verse 32, where he says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? In other words, if God brought you out of the equivalent of Egypt, or if God has given you his son, if he's already done the hard part in saving you, then how in the world is he going to desert you now? It's like having given you the car, is he going to begrudge you the keys? I mean, if he's going to give you all of this... Why would he stop now? Now look, I think perhaps one of the main reasons we can doubt this is because we have lost sight of the fact that ultimately our salvation is all down to God. You see, when we think that the reason God loves us and is taking care of us is because we're a good person or we've earned our salvation then in that moment we've lost our sense of the miraculous and our future hope shrinks down to being all about our performance. If we believe we've got where we are on the basis of our performance or our resources, then whenever we get into a situation that we don't feel like we have the resources to handle, well, in that moment we'll chicken out, won't we? But if we believe that we're saved by grace, and it's a miraculous thing, then we're able to say that if God brought me this far, 
then why can't he help me do this? So you know what? I'm going to obey. I mean, if he brought me out of Egypt, for goodness sake, he's certainly going to get me safely into the equivalent of Canaan. And just to say, but way on aside, really, if we are afraid of failure, it's surely a telltale sign that we've made it all about our performance. Because when we're assured of God's love for us and his grace and his faithfulness and his unfailing commitment to us, then even if we do fail, we know that doesn't affect how he views us. You see, if Jesus is my security, then I am liberated from the worry of failure and I am free to make courageous decisions. So there you have it. Two reasons why fear is such an affront to God. It makes him too small and it forgets his saving work. Let's finish off by very quickly tackling the second question, namely, how then do we replace fear with faith? Well, to put it simply, the difference between Joshua and Caleb and the rest of the spies, I think, was where they chose to look. In other words, when there are giants looming on the horizon, where the future looks scary, where we could be tempted to shrink back in fear, what we need to do is get our focus right. Really, to press forward in faith, we need to be captured by the right vision. First of all, we need to look back. Now, just to be clear, there's a right way to look back and also a wrong way. If you remember the Israelites, they looked back through rose-tinted spectacles and they saw Egypt as being the land flowing with milk and honey. That's the wrong way to look back. And you know what? I think this remains a very real temptation for us today. You see, when things get scary or uncertain, it's natural to want to go back to what we know might be slipping back into familiar sins or habits as a way of consoling yourself. Or it could simply be wanting everything to return to how things were pre-COVID, where actually God is opening up new opportunities for us that require developing a whole range of new habits and new ways of doing things. What the Israelites actually needed to look back and see was that returning to their old life of slavery was not an option and that God had set them free for something way, way better. And we need to do the same. I don't know. Perhaps you need to repent of clinging on to things for security that are not God. Or maybe it's a case of resolving right now that you're going to embrace uncertainty and follow God into the unknown. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everything about life before COVID was awful and we need to throw it all out. But I would encourage you over the next week to set aside a bit of time to reflect honestly on what aspects of your old life you don't want to go back to. So first of all, look back. Secondly, look around. God's assessment of the Israelites really couldn't have been a whole lot more damning. He says, They've all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again they've tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. Seems unthinkable, doesn't it? That Having seen God lead them out of Egypt in such extraordinary circumstances, splitting the Red Sea, obliterating the Egyptian army, providing manna and quail, guiding them with a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, giving them his very presence among them. Instead of being thankful, they moaned, they grumbled and they rebelled. But you know what? I think we can be the same, can't we? We can be so consumed by our current situation that we end up losing sight of the many blessings of God all around us. Once again, 
I want to encourage you this week to take the time to look around, to open your eyes, to see the many blessings of God in your own life and the lives of others. And don't just stop at that. Turn it back to him in thankfulness. So look back, look around. Thirdly, then look forward with faith. Let's be real. There are going to be any number of challenges ahead of us, aren't there? But also some pretty wonderful opportunities. It's going to be costly. It's going to be painful. But the future that God is preparing for us will ultimately be worth it. Remember back a year to the word that Rich brought about the lake being drained. The, the purpose was to cleanse it so fresh water would come teeming with life. Esther Lee shared a prophetic word recently about God setting new boundary lines for us as a church, requiring us to build in a different way. Last week, Ginny spoke in terms of God sending revival. It's coming closer, which is all well and good. But I think probably there's a little bit of cynicism in all of us. What's more, some of us are carrying so much disappointment from the past that it's hard to muster up the faith needed to advance. But as we've seen, the key to getting the courage to move forward is to get a bigger view of God. As Joshua and Caleb exhorted the people, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So once again, so over the next week, I'd like to invite you to pray for what's to come. Won't you dream? Won't you use your imagination? Won't you ask big? Be open to the prophetic. And if you find that hard, why don't you confess it to God? Let him know where you're fearful, where you're lacking faith, where you're overwhelmed with worry. And then invite him to help you trust him. And then fourthly, and finally, above all else, look to Jesus. It's interesting to note that Jesus and Joshua are the same name. They're different ways of translating the Hebrew word for saviour. And in many respects, Joshua was the forerunner of Jesus. He was a saviour, a leader in their midst, bearing the first fruits of the future. Tragically, though, God's people didn't listen to Joshua. They feared the giants more than they trusted their Jesus. They turned back from the Lord's will for them, and an entire generation ended up perishing in the wilderness. How about you? What or who will you look to? I want to urge you to look to Jesus. He has gone through death and come back bearing the first fruits of new creation life. How frightening the future looks. With him we can move forwards trusting that the best really is yet to come. And really, in a nutshell, that's what these 40 days are all about. They're basically an invitation to draw nearer to Jesus. My appeal to you would be, do not pass up the opportunity. Won't you make the most of this time and press into him? Well, we are nearly at the end of today's service, but I've got a few pieces of news that I would love to share with you. 
Firstly, in relation to the 40 days of prayer, there are several things going on in and amongst the church that you can get involved in and we would love you to be part of. I have got four ways that you might want to get involved with the 40 days of prayer. Firstly, um, is our Sunday evening prayer meeting. This is our regular prayer meeting and details are on the Church Central website, but it is a great chance to get together with others in the church and pray for our city and our church and um, the things that are on people's hearts. Secondly, we have just started our Abide Evenings and these are a chance to have, spend 45 minutes with no agenda, um, just together in God's presence and to seek him and to see what happens. Um, so please do log in, again, details on the website, and then thirdly, we have our weekday um, prayer meetings. These are just 15 minutes in the morning, 7.45, just to set you off and give you a chance to um, just spend a bit of time in the morning before going to work or off to school, um, just uh, before God and to give your day to him. And then finally, our podcast series. This week, we have the wonderful Rach Martin, and she is going to be talking to us about prayer throughout the Bible and that how we can grow um, in our knowledge and our prayer life through those. So that'd be great. And then secondly, you will have noticed that for the last two weeks, we have launched in-person church meetings. These are happening at Central House. Um, they are all completely COVID safe and secure. But as part of that, it means that we do have to sign up to them. There are a limited number of spaces because we need to make sure that we can stay socially distanced. And so on Tuesday mornings, the uh, sign up for those goes live. Please do come along. Um, I went last week uh, with two of the kids and I'll be honest, I was quite apprehensive. Um, for us, I think it's been a couple of weeks really of going back, um, going back to um, non-essential shops, going back to university, going back to school after Easter. And all of these things are um, just stepping slightly out of the comfort zone of the last year. Obviously, they're places that were familiar, but are now a little different. Um, and so, yeah, we were a little bit apprehensive. Um, and I'm going to give you a positive and a negative of our time together. So first of all, the negative, I'm going to start with the bad. I have discovered that actually I am not very good at humming uh, through worship or wearing a mask <laughs> and trying to have a conversation over a two metre gap with a mask on is quite hilarious. <laughs> but I will also share a positive and this is something that I didn't even expect actually to get out of the morning. Um, but just was amazing really it was the um thing that i didn't think i'd really missed but i had and it's the in the moment um it was really amazing to um hear people praying um inspired by one another inspired by what god was doing in the moment and responding to to the in the moment action and that was amazing um, and also afterwards actually just um, being able to chat to people outside just for a few minutes hearing about a friend who's got a new job another one who's actually not very well and things that I just wouldn't have heard of in the week um, had I not been there and so really came away just really grateful actually for an experience of being part of the church family in the actual moment and the spontaneity that comes from that and the um, collaboration I think that comes from that was was brilliant so I really encourage you um yeah please do sign up in the coming uh, couple of weeks and uh yeah give it a go and then finally we have our online coffee time and that'll be starting at 11 30 so you've got just enough time probably to pop the kettle on um or to uh, reach into the back of the fridge and find something nice to drink and then log on and spend a bit of time chatting um, in breakout rooms with people from the church. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. And again, um, I wish you a really fantastic week ahead. Bye-bye.